Hallelujah. Keep that music playing, Brother Will. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Certainly thank the Lord for uh, those of you that uh, are tuning in and coming online and uh, that are in the room. Amen. It is, uh, uh, the weather was very bad uh, just a few, few minutes ago. Amen. Uh, they say if you don't like the weather in Ohio, just wait 15 minutes and it will change. Um, and again, we recognize and appreciate uh, those that um, uh, are watching online, but especially those of us that have gathered uh, here in the house of the Lord uh, tonight for our Bible study. Uh, those that will be watching us online, we welcome you and we thank God uh, for each of you. Uh, and before we get into our Bible study, I want to know if there are any uh, prayer requests. So if you're watching online, I want you just to type in there, uh, pray for me. And if you want to be specific uh, and provide details as to what you uh, would like that prayer to be, you can do that. That's your choice. Uh, but if not, we certainly want to know who we're praying for. Amen. And again, we thank God for those of you that are here in the room and saints are coming and we bless God. Uh, we bless God for that. Amen. Prayer requests, prayer requests, prayer requests. It's prayer time. Somebody say it's prayer time in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It is good to be uh, in the presence of God's people. Amen. And I'm grateful again for those of you that are here. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer. We recognize uh, those that have, have spoken requests that are raising your hand uh, for yourself or for somebody else. And we recognize that there are requests that are coming in online. Let's go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for allowing us to come again in the presence of the Lord. We, you, you brought us here, Lord God. You brought us over the highways. Uh, you brought us through another storm, uh, another set of storms, and there was so much news coverage and other things uh, that went forth today. So we know, Lord God, that we don't count it lightly that we have been blessed to arrive here in this room. We pray, Lord, for every need that is represented here. We pray for every need that is represented online, uh, for every family, every situation, every circumstance, uh, every dilemma, uh, every problem, every pain, every ache, every need, Lord God, every, every request, O oh God. Uh, we know, Lord God, that you are able to do it, and we touch and agree in the spirit realm and we ask that you do whatever needs to be done. Lord, break, we ask, Lord God, that you will bless the brokenhearted, that you will bless the downtrodden, that you will bless, Lord God, those that are coping with uh, horrific setbacks, those, Lord, that don't know what they're going to do, those that don't know what tomorrow will hold, uh, but we know who holds tomorrow. We pray for this Bible study on tonight. We ask, Lord God, that you will give us clarity uh, of mind. Let us hear uh, in real time what you are saying to us tonight. We give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Let everybody say in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Put your hands together. Let's give God some praise. Now, we're going to get right into... Uh, our Bible study uh, tonight, and uh, I want us to do a comparison uh, of a couple of scriptures. Uh, the first scripture is going to be 1 Samuel chapter number 16. 1 Samuel chapter number 16, and we're going to look at verse number 11. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 11, and we're going to compare that scripture with 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. 
We're going to compare these two uh, scriptures before you tonight, and I think uh, you'll recognize uh, almost immediately uh, what, um, what we are pulling out from it. First Samuel chapter 16, verse number 11, we read that scripture early, um, last week. Uh, the Lord said, uh, and Samuel said unto Jesse, are there any, uh, are here all thy children? And he said, there remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. And with all of a beautiful countenance, everybody say he was beautiful, he, a beauty, beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. He was handsome. And the Lord said, anoint him for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So David's anointed king, but is he king? He's not king, but he is anointed king. All right, now uh, uh, go over to 2 Samuel chapter number 5. 2 Samuel chapter number 5. Hallelujah. 2 Samuel chapter number 5. Um, verse number one. Verse number one, then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron and spake saying, behold, they are, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that ledest us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, thou shalt feed my people Israel and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king uh, to Hebron and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David king over Israel. He's king. They anointed him king over Israel. Verse number four. David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 40 years. How old was he? 30. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. We talked last week about young David. Uh, young David is introduced to us as a shepherd. However, uh, he was also a skillful musician. Before he was known as a warrior, before he was this confident leader, David was a gifted musician. According to scripture, he had developed a reputation for his ability to play or make music. And this was actually his first introduction to the king. Now let's pick up, let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and we're going to start at verse 14. Amen. I think I need to move my mic down a little bit. It's good? All right. Verse 14. Well, let's go to verse 13. Verse 13 says, the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Verse 14 says, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. I would not want to be Saul. Amen. I would not want to be Saul. An evil spirit came upon him. Now, Verse 15, and Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to speak, seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp, 
and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, provide now me a man that, that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing and a valiant man and a man of war and prudent in matters and a comely person. And guess what? The Lord is with him. Verse 19, Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. David was always with the sheep. And Jesse took, Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David, his son, to, unto Saul. Now, I'm going to pause here because I want you to notice that David's father is a giving person. Later on in chapter 18, he's, when he sends food to his sons, he also sends food to the captains. Y'all remember that? So now Saul is asking for David, and Jesse says, don't just go, David. Take an offering to the king, too. Now, David goes. He came to Saul. He stood before him. I'm in verse 21. Are y'all with me? He stood before him, and immediately the Bible says he loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. This is before he slew Goliath. So uh, uh, in, in, in verse 22, and Saul sent to Jesse saying, let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found what? Favor in my sight. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God would come upon Saul that David took his heart and played with his hand and Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him. So Saul would have fits, fits of rage. And when he would get in one of his moods, it would be bad. I could hear Saul just going crazy, just, ah, just, ah, just throwing stuff. And, and, and all the servants would be scared. Oh, no, Saul's having one of his fits. What are we going to do? He's slamming doors and, 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 and throwing the sofa over and turning tables over, just having a fit. And then David would come in with his heart. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. And Saul would be like, ah, with wisdom. Ah, our God is an awesome. Oh, Saul would calm down. And David would leave. And everybody would be so happy. Woo, David, don't go far, man. We don't know what we would do if it wasn't for you and your heart. Man, we Saul was having a fit. He was having a doozy. And every time Saul would have a doozy, they called David. David, go get your heart. Come on in. Saul's having a fit. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. And Saul would calm down. Then... Things change. But, but, but notice in verse 11, 12, and 13. When Samuel anoints David king, notice something. Who's there? Samuel, all of his brothers, and David. This young handsome, good-looking kid, and he's a musician, he's strong, something good to look at. I don't have a prop, so I thought I would just create a little David for us. We're going to say this is David. Everybody say, hi, David. Now, Samuel, in those days, they didn't have little bottles of oil. 
they would fill the ram's horn with oil and they wouldn't dip their finger in it and put a little nap, dab on the forehead. He would take the oil and he poured the oil on David's head, all of it. And that oil ran down his head, down his face, down his beard, down his clothes, and David's brothers are sitting there looking at him like, what? He just anointed David king. David in the field, David the musician, David the, the baby boy. Samuel just poured the oil on David. Now let me ask you a question. What, what do you expect at this point in his life? What would your expectations be of young David? What, 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 do, you, what do you think he's going to become? What kind of life do you expect for, for young David? Talk to me. Young David, you just got anointed king. What do you expect for him? Royalty. Somebody say royalty. Get the robe out. He was already from a good, good family. Family had money. But you just, he was just anointed king. Royalty. What, what, what else do you expect? What, what do you think, what kind of life is David going to have? He's just been anointed king. He's going to, leisure. Snap, snap, servants. The best of everything. That's the life we expect David to have. Now, I'm going to leave David there for a reason. Because there are two questions that we have to use our imaginations with as it pertains to David. Question number one, what went through David's mind when, king, when the king sent him to play? Now, if we follow the chronology of the text, David's anointed king, and then a few verses later, he gets the call from Saul to come play. David's probably thinking, you know, I have been anointed king. But Saul's calling me already. I wonder what's getting ready to happen. Maybe David is imagining that, that, that Saul's just going to turn the kingdom over to him. You know how we do. Uh, uh, I mean, Samuel, after all, is the one that anointed him king. The second question is, what did everybody expect would become of David? Everybody thought that this was David's big moment. This is it. They weren't expecting it, but it's happening. And boy, were they wrong. No one could have imagined in their wildest dreams the journey that lay ahead of young David. His transition from boy to man was not sweet, but bitter. What seemed like it would be a glorious journey ahead of him was filled with turmoil and chaos. Here's a life lesson for you. God's will is not always easy. It includes all sorts of upheaval. And we do well to realize that as bad as the, as the Lord allows things to become, they could always be worse. Whatever you're going through is bad. And sometimes we sing that song, Lord, why me? But I need you to know that things could always be worse. Can I get one amen? And just, all you got to do is imagine life if God was not with us, right? God was with David, and we're getting ready to see some of what happened to him. Unfortunately, we don't have three key pieces of information about David's life. We know that he was 30 years old when he began to reign. We know that. We read that in the scripture. But what we don't know with certainty or I couldn't find, with certainty, is how old David was when he 
defeated Goliath. I don't know how long David served before he was forced to leave. I don't know how many years David had to avoid Saul. We, we don't know that. I, I looked, I had heard 15 years, and I saw some research that suggested that, that, that the whole journey was 15 years. I, I saw some research that suggested uh, that, that he ran from Saul for seven years. I saw some that said it was five years. We, we don't know for sure how long this lasted. But we do know that when it happened, David would have been a young man. Uh, here's a life lesson for you. We should never underestimate the importance of the formative teen and 20s years. Although young people think they are grown when they get to their 20s. How many people know? <laughs> How many people know you, you may be an adult, but you're not through growing? I'm not talking about physically. Major things happen in those years. Major things. I wish that when you graduated high school, that was it. You're okay, I'm done. Life is set. But, but major things happen in those, those late teen years and those 20s. Those are important years. That's why it's so important that we focus on those that are in their teens and 20s and don't just assume that they, they can leave and go out into the world and just do their thing and maybe they'll come back. No, don't do your thing. Don't do that. I, I know you 19, I know you 18, I know you grown, but, but, but major stuff happens in these in those years. Everybody say major stuff. David literally lost everything he valued. He was forced to leave town. He had become a staple in Saul's house. He had access to both Saul and Saul's family. And, and after he killed Goliath, things got better and things were going well. And all of a sudden, all of that was taken away. So taken away, gone. And life was hard for David. Everybody say it was hard for David. Hard for David. Let, let me show you. Let's, let's go to um, 1 Samuel. Um, chapter number 21. Life was hard for David. David had to leave. He was forced to leave. Everybody say he was forced to leave. I think I want chapter 20. Yeah, chapter 21. Chapter 21. Let's start at verse number 10. How you doing over there, David? You got anointed king. You're going to be the king someday. Look at verse 10. So, uh, David had to leave. Y'all with me? And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul. And he went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king? David was probably like, Don't call me that. Is this not David the king of the land? They did not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And David laid up these words in his heart and was so afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And look at verse 13. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned or pretended himself to be mad in their hands. He pretended to be crazy. 
and, and the scrabble on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. D D David, this, this kid, that just, y'all remember last week, he was talking all that noise, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? They were singing songs about it, but now David said, I think I need to pretend to be crazy. They were like, <laughs> he was writing on the walls, he was drooling, he was like going crazy, like David lost his mind, let him go. David. David, is that, is that you? Life was hard. D David was forced to live in the wilderness. <laughs> David was forced to live in a cave. I don't know if there's anybody here that's ever lived in a cave before. But, but it's nothing nice. I haven't seen a nice cave. David lost it all. Just, just a, a, a few days or weeks earlier, David was eating at the table with the king. He was sitting there with the, with the other fellas, with Jonathan and Ishmael and, and, and Michael. And, and, and if they, when they, it's dinner time. David came on with him. He had a seat at the table. Remember, Jonathan said, they're going to miss you. He had a seat at the table. He, he was in. And one day, Saul had a fit. David got his heart. Our God is an awesome God. Saul grabbed that spear. He ran through. Through that spear, David. David said, he reigns from heaven. With wisdom and power. David was like, I'm out of here. One day, he's sitting at the table. The next day, he's running in the house to his wife. Your daddy's trying to kill me, and they're on their way to get me. Can you picture that scene? He's what? He's trying to kill me. What am I going to do? Because David's a young man. What am I going to do? Michael's like, you got to get out the window. What? Out the window. Here, we're going to figure this out. Get out the window. Run. Run, David. Run. Jonathan comes out. Oh, man, let me talk to my daddy. I'm going to see if I can work this out. Man, we love you, man. We, everybody love you, man. Yeah, I know, man. Talk to your daddy. See if we can figure this out. Jonathan comes back, talks to his daddy. His daddy threatens to kill him. Jonathan goes back, says, hey, man, I don't know what to tell you, Doc. Doc Daddy's just, I mean, he's just lost it. The best thing for you is just to go. David's like, go where? Like, you can't come here because Daddy's going to get you. Well, what about my wife? What about my family? I don't know. You just got to go. He lost it all. He lost it all. Something strange happened, though. <laughs> Something really strange happened. As David has to leave, as David has to, to run for his life, people heard about what he was going through, and they came to join him. They came without caring about themselves or their future or what their future would be like. They, they were drawn to him not because of his cause. They were drawn to him because of his character. They knew, everybody knew something was wrong with Saul. That wasn't a secret. But, 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 they came because it was David. It was the way he carried himself in good times that attracted the loyal friends he would need in bad times. It turns out that the way David conducted himself in his early years was as important to his future 
as what he would do later in life. Here's a life lesson for you. The people we interact with in good times could be the people we desperately need in bad times. We read it, I won't go back to it, but we read it in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse number 5, how David went whithersoever Saul sent him. And every time David would go out and come in, people would say, oh, I like David. You go down to verse number 12, uh, the, the Bible says that David, uh, th that everywhere David went, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. Every time David went somewhere, people would say, God's with that kid. Over in verse number 14, again, David behaved himself wisely in all his ways. Verse number 16, again, we see it, all Israel and Judah loved David. The way he carried himself. See, God connects some people during and or for difficult times. Some of the people you meet when things are going well are not what I call good friends. They are God friends. People that God puts in our lives. Uh, and the reverse is also true. Sometimes God puts you in somebody's life for what's coming their way. The Bible says, uh, a friend loveth at all times, but a brother is born for adversity. There's some people that God brings in our lives specifically for a time of adversity. So now here's what I want you to notice. Now we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter number um, 22. 1 Samuel 22. I got my notes out of order, but I know where I'm going. So now David has left, we just saw him pretending to lose his mind. Chapter 22, now David departs and he escapes to the cave of Dulem. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Now here, here comes Eliab and here comes Shammah. These are some big boys. These are, some, these, are some, these are some warriors, right? Here they come, and we read later on and find out that Daddy and Mama Jesse were there too. Old man Jesse came. Here come old man Jesse and, and Mama Jesse to the cave of Dula. David's sitting in the cave. <laughs> he said, what? Daddy? Mama, Eliab, my, all my people coming up to the cave to see about David. We heard what happened, man. We were with you. Eliab singing a different song. Now, we were with you, man. Hey, we're going we gonna to do this thing together. So David's probably like, okay, that's my family. It's good to see y'all because now David's, David's worried like he's scared. He's scared like what's getting ready to happen because he knows if, if Saul's after me, he's already, you know, uh, 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 showed that, that he's a ruthless man. No, there's no telling what he's going to do. So his family comes. Notice what happens in verse 2. It's not just his family. Everyone that was in distress... <laughs> Wait a minute, what, who are the rest of these people? I know, I know, Jesse, I know daddy and mama and my brothers and, and maybe their wives and my sisters and his, her bad boys. His sisters had some bad boys. Here they come. They just, they just running up there like, what's up, Uncle David? It's old, man. Y'all know how your nephews can be. But, but after them, people that are in distress. And, and everyone that had debt. And everyone 
that was discontented, they gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. They can't all fit in the cave. Now notice what he does next. This is amazing. David went thence to Mitzvah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you. David has built all of these relationships. I mean, lots of relationships. And he's talking to a king. He said, I, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to take care of mom and dad. Why? I know until I know what God will do for me. Until I know what God's going to do. Can you feel this? Hey, David, you all right? I, I, I need you to take care of my mom and dad. My, mom was probably like, no, I'm going with you, David. I'm going, David's like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what we're going to do. I have no idea. So, so I need y'all to be safe while we see what God's going to do. Has anybody ever had to do that? You just have to say, I just, I don't know what God, I know God's going to do something, but I'm going to have to wait and see what God's going to do for me. David said, I'm going to have to wait and see what God's going to do for me. But in the meantime, we're going to have to be on the run. We're going to have to be on the go. And we, we're not going to be able to worry about you, mom and daddy. So I, I, I took care of you. I made provisions for you. So a lot of things happen. All right, so, so David kills Goliath. David becomes good friends with Jonathan. Saul gets jealous. He marries Michael. Saul tries to kill David. Jonathan warns David. Now David's on the run. David is on the run. He, 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 he's, he's eating holy bread because he's starving. He runs to Gath. He's hiding in a cave. Then he has to go to a city, uh, Keilah. And when he gets there, uh, he, has to, he has to save the whole city. Saul is on his track. Saul is on his trail. And David's trying to figure out what's he going to do. Look at chapter number 23. Look at chapter 23. Hallelujah. Chapter 23 and verse number 7. Chapter 23, verse number 7. Everybody say, life is hard. How hard is it? it, it it's so hard that it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah, and Saul said, God had delivered him into my hand. Look at verse 13. Then David and his men, which were about 600, People are finding. It's amazing. They could find it, but Saul couldn't find it. Now he's got 600 people, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah. And where'd they go? They went where, whithersoever they could go. Has anybody ever been there? Has anybody ever had to just go whithersoever you could go? Have you ever had to take an apartment because that was with us or wherever you could go? Have you ever had to say, I'll sleep on the couch. I just need a few days to figure out what God's going to do for me. And, 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 but the couch wasn't available, so you say, I'll sleep on the floor. You're just going with us so ever they could go. How do 600 people go with us so ever they could go? How did they do that? And now David is responsible for them. How does it feel to be responsible for 600 men and not have a place for them to live? 600 homeless people. With one thing in common, they loved David. They cared about David. Oh, I, I wouldn't, I, I tell you, when I think about what David's going through, not for a few days, 
But for years, David's having to go, as the old folk used to say, from pillar to post. So now, things keep happening. Samuel dies. David's hooking up with people that he, all kind of folk. David ended up with eight wives. He, he spares Saul's life. Uh, uh, David flees to the Philistines. Do you know how ridiculous it was for David to say, I'm going to go and live in Philistine country? <laughs> First of all, never mind. All right, so he's living with, he's trying to live with the Philistines because he's going with us wherever he could go. Like, maybe if I go over here, Saul will leave me alone. Mm. He spares Saul's life again. David flees. David, the Philistines are like, no, nah, bro, we don't trust you. You got to go. You and your 600 homeless people, y'all got to go. <laughs> And, 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 and while they're gone, the Amalekites come and take all their wives and children. And, and then the 600s are like, bro, we came out here for you. Maybe we need to stone you. Maybe, maybe we need to solve this and we'll do what Saul's trying to do and we'll have somewhere to go because you will be gone. David had to encourage himself. Then in, in chapter 31, Saul and Jonathan are killed. David is like, oh, man, okay, Saul's dead, but what about Jonathan? No, Jonathan too. Then they make Ishbosheth the king, and David knows Ishbosheth because he's Saul's son. So, so David's like, okay, well, I'm, I'm supposed to be the king because Samuel anointed me king, but... It didn't come to me. What does this mean? I know Ishmael, but Ishmael is like, no, I'm the king now, bro. So now there's a battle. Abner uh, uh, joins David. Joab kills Abner. David gets upset. David mourns Abner. Ishmael gets murdered. And finally in chapter 5 of 2 Samuel chapter 5, David becomes king. Now, how many of y'all agree that the fellow that stood there in 2 Samuel chapter 5 is not the same kid that stood there in 1 Samuel chapter 16? 1 Samuel 16, he's talking about how, how he killed the lion and the bear. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He, he, he's, he's, he's confident in God. He's still confident, but, but, but how many people know it's a different kind of confidence? By the time David fulfills the prophecy, I, he didn't look like the same chipper young boy musician. Life had changed him. He, he was now something different. The, the Psalms suggest the same, but I want you to notice this. I want, I want you to write this down. Life changes us, but it should not change our love toward God. Did y'all write that down? Life changes us, but it should not change our love toward God. That's why they call David a man after God's own heart. A good way to guard our hearts is by keeping a praise in our hearts. David's secret to success was his ability to navigate through life, through the trials and dangers of life, without losing his joy. So all of this stuff that happened didn't stop David from praising God. Can I say this? If this was Sunday morning, I'd tell y'all to write this down. It is possible to lose things except your joy. It's possible to lose valuable things, but still hold your joy. Everybody say, I still have joy. 
And if you don't believe this is true, we're going to go to Psalm 145. We're going to Psalm 145. In life, sometimes we lose things. We have, we have setbacks. But, but, but I want you to listen to how David responded. Many of the Psalms were written by David while he's going through what we call the Saul experience. Uh, some of them were written, there's a great Psalm that's written from the cave of Adullam. And we have to make sure that we get to a point that even though life changes, our love for God and our joy doesn't change. I may not look like young Harold. May not feel like young Demetrius. I may not be able to run like young Terrence may not be as, as quick-minded as the young version of you. But how many people can say, I still have my joy? Lost some things, lost some important people, had to wait on what God promised me, and it didn't come like I thought it would. Has that ever happened to you? You got it, but it cost you more than you thought it was going to cost you. You never thought you would have to go through what you've gone through to see what God was going to do for you. But God was faithful, and you know God was faithful. God brought you through, but life has changed you. When life changes you, check your joy. And how can you check your joy? How can you check it? Check your praise. So now, we're at Psalm 145. I have a feeling somebody's praising God right now. Somebody's praising God because you, you can relate to what David experienced. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to convey this, right? I'm trying to convey this, that David in, at the age of 30, David's standing there and he's got all the tribes around him. They weren't there the first time. He's got the support of, his, of the people with one exception, one group's exception, and that didn't last too long. And I'm wondering if David starts to reflect in his mind on all of the things he had to go through. Maybe he thought about playing before Saul and thought about the women that were singing and then he started to think about how they had to run and hide and avoid and duck and dodge and he started to think about all the people that Saul had killed trying to get to him. Those, those kinds of things affect you. But it didn't affect his praise. I'm in Psalm 145. Now, if you're looking in your Bible, at the top of Psalm 145, you should see the words, a Psalm of David, or David's psalm of praise, something that says David wrote it. Whenever you read a psalm, always look ahead of it, above it, and get an idea who wrote it. And when you see that David wrote the psalm, I want you to remember this Bible study. And remember, David did not always write from a place of comfort and joy. You don't have to have money in the bank to praise God. You don't have to have a, a fancy car to praise God. If you do, something wrong with your relationship with God. As a matter of fact, I have found 
that some of the best praise comes when you're broke. And you find five dollars. <laughs> hey, whoa, I can't. Thank you. Anybody ever reach in the pants pocket in the dirty clothes and pull out some money and you just say, oh, Lord, I just. Anybody ever had that and you literally go in and start crying? You just, you literally are like, God, you are so amazing. Those, that, that's our best praise. We often hear pre preachers say, give God your best praise. And we think my best praise is when I got, you know, the, the new this or got the new that. No, 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 your best praise sometimes comes when, when what you thought you wanted, you didn't get. And, and, and what you thought you had, what you thought belonged to you, uh, wasn't for you. And you said, I'm going to praise God anyhow. Listen to the way David praises God. David says, I will extol thee, my God, O king, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Let me ask you, how long is forever? Well, if, if, that, if that's how long forever is, how long is forever and ever? That's how long David said he was going to praise God. God. David said, I'm not just going to settle forever. I want you to know, God, that I'm going to praise you forever and ever. Everybody say forever and ever. See, some of us only praise God for a moment. It's like, it's like the worship leader says, come on, everybody, give God some praise. Okay. That's it. Then, then the worship leader has to come back and say, all right, give God more praise. <laughs> then, then, then the worship leader says, okay, everybody shout, hallelujah. And everybody shouts. That's exactly what they do. Everybody mumbles, hallelujah. That's not praising God forever and ever. Praising God forever and ever is, it is, is not, come on, everybody clap your hands. It's when you just start. <laughs> you just start clapping your hands. I bless God for more people that praise God inherently, automatically. You just... Praise God. Nobody has to tell you to say anything. Hello? Anybody know what I'm talking about? No, nobody. We call it pumping and priming. When, when you are a true praiser, you do not have to be pumped and primed. True praisers have to be turned down. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord. Okay. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I love you. When I think of the goodness of, that's forever and ever. Verse 2, notice what he says. What does he say? Somebody say every day. Somebody say every day. Every day I will do what? Bless thee. And I will praise thy name. There he is again. Every day. Somebody say every day. So while David was in Adullam, every day. While David was in Keilah, every day. While David was running from Saul, every day. While David was worried what was going to happen to his wife and children, everybody say every day. We've got to get to a point that no matter what happens to us, we're going to bless God every day. What you doing tomorrow? Praising God. What you going to do the day after tomorrow? Praising God. What you doing this weekend? What you doing next month? What you doing the month after that? What are your plans for the summer? What are you doing in the fall? You have plans for Christmas? What about 2025? What about the year after that? 
What is your five-year plan? What is your 10-year plan? What is your retirement plan? What are you going to do? I want to be the person, I want to be the person that when I get old and, and I want the hospice nurse to ask my family what language is he speaking? I don't know. He's speaking in tongues because he's praising God every day. In verse number three, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. David didn't discover that after he became king. Oh, I'm king now. God must be great. David told his mama and daddy, I'm going to send you all to Moab while I see what God's going to do for me. David knew that God was going to bring him out. David had a promise in his heart. He says, I, I just got to see what God's going to do. And when God did it, God got the same level of praise. Stop saving your praise for your praise report. Stop saving your testimony for testimony service. God is great right now. Verse number four. He says what? One generation. One generation shall praise thy work to another and shall declare thy mighty works. Why is that? Because God's good to everybody. The, the old folk are praising God to the young folks. And the young folk are praising God with the old folk because God's good to everybody. He says, verse 5, I feel like I'm preaching. I'm supposed to be teaching. Whew. He says, I will speak of thy glorious honor, of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works. He keeps on going. Listen to him. Praise God. If you want to know how to praise God, just read this. You, you want to praise? When you go home, I want you to read this psalm and pray. This is a praise. See, we think, we think this is a praise. Ooh, I praise God. I cut my step. Good, if you got one. But if you don't have a step, you, you got, there's more to praising God than having a step. Somebody say amen. amen. You want to praise God? Here we go. Men shall speak of thy might, of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is, I'm in verse number eight, by the way. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Y'all want to praise God with me? I'm in verse number nine. Come on, praise him with me. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Keep praising God. Oh, we having praise service tonight. Keep praising. Verse 11. Keep praising. Verse 12. Keep praising. Verse 13. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Verse 14. Keep praising. <laughs> What? And raises up all those that be bowed down. Verse 15, keep praising him. Keep praising him. Thou openest thine hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him. To all that call upon him in truth, he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will be destroyed. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name. How long? Forever and ever. Hallelujah. 
So for those of you that came in late, this is David. This is young David. Young, ruddy David. Young, good-looking David. Young, confident David. But young David went through some things. It took him years before he came into his full uh, kingdom. But he probably looked different. He, he, his voice changed. He, he probably said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? By the time he got to become king, he was probably saying, Lord, I just want to thank you. He probably couldn't even hit that note anymore. Huh? His, his, his beard and, and his eyes were, were different. And, and although he was 30, he had fought a bunch of battles. And, and he probably had some battle scars on him. He had some weight on him. He had, he'd gone through some things. But one thing never changed about David. The same praise he gave God when he was in the shepherd's field is the praise he gave God when he was in Saul's house. The same praise he gave him when he was in the cave is the same praise he gave him when he came into his kingdom. My brothers and sisters, whatever you go through in life, never let your praise go down. No matter what, keep your praise up. And even when you don't know what God's going to do, you can have the faith of David and say, I'm going to wait and see what God is going to do for me. And God's going to bless you. He's going to keep his word. Come on, put your hands together and praise God forever and ever. <laughs> Hallelujah. Forever and ever. Next week, uh, we're going to talk about David and one of David's bad tendencies. We're going to talk about how David often failed to deal with things. And, and when you don't deal with stuff, it don't go away. And then we're going to learn this from David. We're going to learn how important it is to deal with stuff. And some of what we got to deal with is not easy. Everybody say, but we got to deal with it. So next week, I want you all to come back, and I want you to bring somebody with you. Everybody say 50. Everybody say 50. I'm looking for 50 people to be in Bible study next Wednesday night. 50. 50. Somebody say, only 50? Well, I got 50 that comes at 1 o'clock. Amen? So the 50 at 1 o'clock and 50 tomorrow, uh, Wednesday night, that's going to be 100. Our goal is to double both of those numbers. I believe God wants us not only to continue to minister online, but I believe that there's some folk that will learn best when they're in the room. Amen? So I want, I want you to come back, because I know you will, because you, you got something out of Bible study tonight. But I want you to encourage somebody to come with you. Amen? So, so, so we can see more and reach more people. For those of you that are watching online, we appreciate you for watching and we want you to sow into this ministry so maybe next time we can have a real David, a mannequin, maybe we can have a mannequin offering. Amen. No, I'm just, I'm not, we're not going to need this next time. But I do want you to sow into this ministry. You're being blessed by it. Your giving helps us to keep doing more to enhance uh, the quality of what we do. If you, if you tithe here, keep tithing, uh, amen, and support this ministry. For those of you that are here, please remember you can give uh, as you exit uh, the building. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word, for all things that we have read and seen. We thank you for allowing us the privilege to walk through the scriptures and not feel rushed but to learn from the scriptures, to go deep into the Old Testament and pull out truths that will make us better, better believers, better husbands, better fathers, better wives, better sisters, 
better saints. Now, Lord God, bless us all to get home safely and let us find that things are well when we get there. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Hallelujah.